on the third Sunday of July, 1637, a riot occurred in the Scottish capital city of Edinburgh, and the roots of the riot lay in a church service in St. Giles Cathedral, that ancient building that stands majestically on the Royal Mile. Charles I was the second of the Stuart kings to straddle the thrones of England and Scotland. Having ascended to the throne after his father James I of England and the sixth of Scotland, and Charles was totally convinced that he was divinely appointed to rule not just the nation, but to rule the church. He had a problem though. In Scotland, though the populace were generally supportive of the monarchy, the influence of John Knox and the Presbyterian form of church rule that he introduced had now taken hold, and the church was governed by elders, as taught in the Bible. These elders ruled the local churches, and formed themselves into presbyteries, and held an annual general assembly to regulate the affairs of the church. There was no place whatsoever in the Scottish church for royal decrees to be proclaimed and enforced. For Charles and his advisers, this was a potentially dangerous situation, To govern the people, Charles needed the church to be reflective of his own beliefs and policies. Since those were the days before mass media and instant news commentary, what the people heard from the pulpit was usually what shaped their beliefs and, of course, their behaviour. Just as the government today uses the media to influence society, Charles I used the pulpits. So Charles much preferred church governance to be from the top down rather than from the bottom up, with the local parishes ruled by an appointed curate or priest who was himself ruled by a bishop, and him by an archbishop with the king himself as the divinely appointed ruler of the church at the head, keeping the whole body in order and thus ensuring a compliant and an orderly society. So Charles began a long strategy to bring the Scottish church into line. By 1637, it was well underway. At that time, the courts of the church were untouched, but he had appointed a few favoured clergymen as bishops. He had changed the communion table into an altar. He compiled a prayer book for ministers to pray with. And he had given the clergy liturgies to chant and surpluses to wear. He then refused permission for a meeting of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. At this point, we must meet another actor in this 17th century ecclesiastical drama. Charles had consistently promoted high churchmen to prominent positions in the English Church, and among these appointees was one Archbishop William Laud, an Anglo-Catholic priest. Laud became Archbishop of Canterbury in 1633 having served two bishoprics previous to his enthronement as archbishop. He was deeply opposed to any form of Calvinism. He was eager to re-establish the pre-Reformation liturgical practices of the English Church, an ambition that led him into disputes and conflict with the English Puritans, the Congregationalists. You're listening to the Semper Reformata podcast with Bob McAvoy. Across the sea to Ireland for a moment, where Laud's influence was also being felt. Their Archbishop Laud was trying to persuade the local bishops to act quickly and to regain the ground that they had lost to the Presbyterian cause. At the beginning of the 17th century, a small number of ministers 
had practised Presbyterianism under the benign watch of the godly Archbishop Usher, under whose authority all the churches in Ireland fell, and whose 15 articles of faith were themselves remarkably Calvinistic. Under Usher's rule, Presbyterians and Anglicans had worshipped together with very little conflict for around 20 years, but Lod changed that and persecuted the Presbyterians and caused several of their ministers to flee, among them the Reverend Robert Blair of Bangor and the Reverend John Livingstone of Kalinche. But let's go back to Scotland, where Laud had drawn up a new liturgy for the Kirk, based loosely on the Anglican Book of Common Prayer and with a very heavy Anglo-Catholic emphasis. It had embedded within it the doctrine of baptismal regeneration, that very essence of Romanism. And that brings us to the events of the 23rd of July, 1637, when the Dean of St Giles, Dean Hannay, first read the new Scottish prayer book, which became known as Laud's Liturgy, at the Cathedral in Edinburgh on the third Sunday in July, 1637. As the service progressed and the dean began to read the liturgy, it is said that a local vegetable seller, one Janet Geddes, known as Jenny, who was in the church for the service, rose to her feet, shouting in her broad accent, Deal colic the way may ye, the devil give you bellyache, you'll no say mass in my lug. Geddes had been sitting on a three-legged stool, and she rushed to the front of the church and flung her stool at the dean. Soon others joined in, and a riot began. The protest spilled over into the street, general disorder ensued, and the whole service was abandoned as the dignitaries fled to safety. Well, needless to say, news of the riot spread fast. Thousands began to flood into Edinburgh to join the protest. It united both the common people and the nobility, who shared a common resentment of English interference upon Scottish independence. Committees, or tables as they were called, were formed, each of them representing one of the four estates of the realm, the nobles, the barons, the burgesses and the clergy. The noblemen's committee took the lead, calling for a petition to resist the Scottish prayer book and the king's reforms. And in God's providence, Charles's attempts to control Scotland through the manipulation of the church were thwarted by a wee woman with a stool. Here's a poem, The Song of Jenny Geddes, by J.S. Blackie. T'was the 23rd of July, in the 1637, On the Sabbath morn from High St. Giles, a solemn peal was given. King Charles had sworn that Scottish men should pray by printed rule. He sent a book, but never dreamt of danger from a stool. The council and the judges with ermine pomp elate, the provost and the baileys in gold and crimson state, for silken vested ladies, grave doctors o' the school, were there to please the king. 
that learned the virtues of a stool. The bishop and the dean came in with muckle gravity, ricked smooth and sleek, but lordly pride was lurking in their eye. Their full-on sleeves were blown and big, like seals in briny pool. They bore a book, but little thought they soon would feel a stool. The dean, he to the altar went, and with a solemn look, he cast his eyes to heaven and read the curious printed book. In Jenny's heart, the blood upwelled with bitter anguish full. Sudden she started to her legs and stoutly grasped the stool. As when a mountain wildcat springs upon a rabbit small, so Jenny on the dean springs with a gush of holy gall. Wilt thou say mass at my logs, thy puppish pullin' full? No, no, she said, and at his head she flung the three-legged stool. A bump, a thump, a crash, a smash, now gentle folks beware. Stool after stool, like rattling heel, came twirling through the air. Well done, Jenny, bravo, Jenny, that's the proper tool. When the devil will out and shows his snout, just meet him with a stool. The council and the judges were smitten with strange fear. The ladies and the bailies, their seats did deftly clear. The bishop and the dean went in sorrow and in dool, and all the puppish flummery fled when Jenny showed the stool. And thus a mighty deed was done by Jenny's valiant hand. Black prelacy and puppery she drew from Scottish land. King Charles, he was a shuffling knave, priest lord a meddling fool. Jenny was a woman wise, who beat them with a stool. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please help to make it better known by opening the podcast app on your phone or mobile device. Then, search for The Semper Reformata Podcast. Subscribe and give it a 5-star rating. See you next time.